Uh, I'll be speaking on Thomas Blackburn. He was one of the owners of Ripon Lodge, uh, now a county historic site. Uh, he had inherited it from his father. We'll talk a little more about that in a second. Uh, but also, we're looking at his life within context of uh, a much older uh, system, which is the Roman senatorial cursus honorum. Uh, Billy, if you'll click that for me. So uh, I'm not going to try and explain all of this, because <laughs> it's quite a bit of text. But the essence is, uh, in the, during the Roman Republic and even into the early years of the empire, uh, young men of senatorial rank, higher social status, that were looking for um, higher political office, there was pretty much a prescribed course you would follow on up through the years. Um, you'd start here down at the bottom, either with a military or civil career, and then work your way up through the administration until you got to be consul or potentially dictator of Rome. Um, so roughly, uh, Thomas Blackburn and the lives of people like Henry Lee, his neighbor, George Washington, for all the effort that uh, the English and colonial American society put into, in some cases, deliberately emulating Rome and Greece and ancient cultures, uh, they didn't really intend something like this sort of fixed progression to happen, and yet it did. So we'll be looking at Thomas's life sort of within that wider framework. Um, so to truly start, uh, we have to go all the way back to England, uh, to the home of Richard, his father. Uh, Richard came from the city of Ripon uh, in England. It's in Yorkshire, uh, a little bit north of uh, the great cathedral city of York itself. Um, this is actually the York, or not York, this is the Ripon Cathedral uh, from the side, coming from a 1730s book um, about the area. So Richard Blackburn himself, uh, when he arrives in America, uh, in the 1720s, uh, he's not terribly impressive uh, an individual from the, the societal standings sort of sense. Uh, he is a carpenter, he is a tradesman. Uh, he, by that point, had quite the career behind him. He was in his uh, early 30s, but he had, since he was a young man, worked within his father's business as an apprentice and then a journeyman carpenter in York and Ripon. Um, it's quite possible that in his early days, he did work on this building itself. Uh, in the 17 teens and 20s, the Ripon Cathedral was undergoing a renovation. They were repairing or replacing or adding a lot of new woodwork. It would have definitely been for a carpenter in the area, it would have been a great source of revenue and a very prestigious project to work on. So it's quite possible in his younger years, Richard did work on that building itself. Um, William, his father, we don't know much about. We don't know much about the wider Blackburn family at home, but we do know their names coming from the baptismal records uh, in England. When Richard arrives here in America, he originally settles down near uh, Yorktown on the Gloucester Peninsula, um, near Gloucester Courthouse. Again, not much record survives of that time. Of course, there was a little thing that happened in the Gloucester County, Yorktown area in uh, the early 1780s, the Battle of Yorktown, the siege there, and the British occupation destroyed a lot of those colonial records. Uh, and then what that didn't, the Civil War finished off a lot of that itself. But we do know he lived there from some scattered letters, remainders, uh, before moving up to the Northern Neck of Virginia where he met his wife, Mary. Married, started a family, and in the 1730s, bought property here in Prince William County, about 1736, he starts acquiring the track that would become Ripon Lodge. And the town of Ripon is what would give Ripon Lodge its name. Although it is an era when spelling is uh, different, less formal than it is today. In Richard's time, Ripon was spelled with two Ps. Today, it's only spelled with one uh, in England. So oftentimes as well, in Prince William County, it is known as Ripon. Um, it's, I come from West Virginia. We have a Ripon with one P that we just call Ripon. So, uh, interestingly enough, also named after this place and Ripon Lodge, <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. So that's kind of Thomas's antecedents. He has Richard who's come to America. He's slowly built up this empire. And when he finally passes away in the 1750s, he leaves behind tens of thousands of acres of land, a ready-built estate for all three of his sons. Uh, only one is going to survive to adulthood to actually claim that inheritance, but he does leave three separate plantations already built up and ready to set up his children uh, with their own estates. Um, I'll take the next one. 
So that does bring us to January of 1742. January 15th, Thomas Blackburn is born at Ripon Lodge to Mary and Richard Blackburn. Um, he is not the oldest child. He's actually the youngest out of his brothers and sisters. Uh, most of them will survive to adulthood or close to it. Um, his eldest brother, William, dies, unfortunately, in a boating accident when he's about 21. Um, their middle brother, Richard, passes away uh, from a respiratory illness a few years later, leaving Thomas to be the one to claim the brother's properties. Now, his sisters also received parts of that big estate, but they mostly received the land, basically investment properties. Um, many of them had already married by the time their father passed, so they already had a home and estate of their own, and the land would give them a little bit of extra either money or a little bit of extra property to then plant in tobacco and increase uh, the size of their estate. This is um, picture not often seen, but this is uh, the side of Ripon that would have been the front when Thomas was born and through most of his life. This is how you would have approached the house at Ripon Lodge, coming from in this direction, Neabsco Creek and the Potomac. Um, by this point, this was photo was taken in the 1920s, so it is missing. There was likely a porch here originally, and you can kind of see, and even in this photo with the uh, calling out being great on the screen, there was an addition made in Thomas's lifetime off to the left side there. So when Thomas is born, uh, he is born into a family that has ascended the social ranks of Virginia. When Richard died, he was no longer just being referred to as Richard Blackburn Carpenter, but Richard Blackburn Gentleman. Uh, he had, through acquiring property, through his marriage to Mary, who was from a very well-to-do family, the Watts in uh, Essex County, Virginia, he had climbed into the top ranks of Virginia society. He was a county justice of the peace. He was a member of the uh, county council and was an estate uh, agent for, among others, Robert Bristow and George Brent, who owned a large swath of what's now Western Prince William County. So Thomas is born into a world where he's expected to follow a similar path, uh, that from his birth, he will slowly climb up those ranks and gain status and prestige for himself. Uh, which, Billy, if you'll click me on a little bit further. Oh. There we go. So the next major figure to enter his life is his wife, Christian. Um, they are only 18 when they get married. Uh, they're both born roughly about the same time in 1742. Um, they knew each other growing up. As I mentioned, Virginia's social circle, and again, most of its European populace, much lower than it is today. So in Prince William County, there were only really about a, maybe a dozen or so families of kind of that well-to-do uh, plantation-owning class that were close enough to really socialize regularly. Uh, kind of a modern frame of reference, Christian's father, Reverend Scott, uh, James, their brothers, uh, his brother Alexander, was at Overwharton Parish down in Aquia. But James uh, and his family lived uh, roughly kind of where Miniville Road hits 234 today. <laughs> That's the rough area uh, where they lived. So compare that to Ripon Lodge, which is on the eastern end of the county, um, a little bit south of Occoquan, north of Dumfries, well, pretty much in between the two of those. So that kind of gives you the idea of what the socializing range is in those days, but it's still not exactly easy. Um, one thing that would have helped in their courtship, uh, Richard is also a vestryman of the Dettingen Parish that covers most of Prince William County at the time, and Reverend Scott's parish. So anytime uh, Richard is going to a parish meeting, it's quite possible that Thomas tagged along to continue his courtship with Christian. Um, they would eventually have six children, two sons, four daughters. Uh, they were married in 1760. They stayed married until Thomas died in 1807. Uh, Christian would outlive him uh, by almost a good decade. She passed away in 1815 um, after Ripon had been sold. But there is uh, our first actual picture of someone here. Um, that painting is later in life. It's the 1790s, but that is um, Christian Scott Blackburn over there to the side. And that is kind of one of the, the first steps for a Virginia gentleman. If he's expecting to go anywhere in society, he has to marry well. Now that can be for love or it can be more of a decision between the two families to either bring themselves together uh, in union and sort of unify their property and estates, much like English aristocrats. Um, more often than not, it's a little bit of both. Um, there's a connection between the, the two kids getting married and it also just so happens it'll be beneficial for both families. But then Mary, we don't know exactly where they spend uh, that first about decade of their marriage. 
while his father had passed three years before, uh, his mother Mary is still living. She lives in, she's still living until July of 1775. So we don't know if they split Rip and Lodge themselves throughout that about decade and a half, uh, or whether they were living on property they owned in the western part of the state. They owned land as far west as Winchester. Uh, and there is evidence they spent some pretty substantial time in the lower Shenandoah Valley, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. So they may or may not have been at Ripon all that time, but by the 1770s, they are living at Ripon full time with their family and with Mary. Um, so that's just sort of the, the baseline starting step. He's married well, he's starting a family, he's kind of establishing himself in the business world uh, of Virginia. And some of the next steps up that ladder are a militia commission. Uh, the county militia of the time, it's uh, very different than our conception of, of the National Guard or even the militia of the Civil War era or the Revolution. In the 1760s, um, technically in 1762, the French and Indian War is still very much uh, an active concern for Virginia's state militia or colonial militia at the time still. Uh, but a lot of that commitment is winding down. Uh, Colonel Washington, George Washington, uh, has been leading the Virginia Regiment through most of the war, but while their recruitment stayed low, they needed more and more militia troops, including men from Prince William County uh, under Major Bayless, who was another family connection of the Blackburns, uh, who served out west fighting the Native Americans in west, what's now West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. But by 1762, that commitment had stepped way back. Um, Thomas did not ever see active service that we know during the French and Indian War. Uh, his position would have mostly been requiring him to drill his company once a quarter. They were all drawn locally within a district. We don't really know exactly how they were drawn out in the 1760s, but it was likely pretty similar to the 1770s, which broke them down kind of roughly into a Dumfries district, a what's now Woodbridge Occoquan, now the Tudor Hall Manassas area and sort of roughly that kind of size until you reach 12 different districts. So you'd have 12 captains, usually two majors, a lieutenant colonel and a colonel. And that's kind of the progression up those ranks follows your progression through life and society. Of course, there is only one colonel, so it's really going to be only the person who's most in favor with the public and with your neighbors is going to get that colonel's commission for the next couple of years. Now the other appointment that holds a little bit more weight because as I mentioned, the militia meet sporadically. Um, there's not really any, the British crown is not providing arms, I'll put it that way. <laughs> and the average Virginian is not really going to be concerned to bring his uh, shotgun or rifle with him uh, to a militia muster or even travel at all to it. Uh, even if it is within the district rather than being held at the county seat in Dumfries, it's still a walk. It's a day away from the plow or a day away from harvest, depending on the season. So militia attendance is not great. Uh, we've pushed the French and their native allies across the Ohio River. It's not going to be a problem again. It'll be a problem again. <laughs> but that's the mindset of the time. So the militia are not terribly active. But what is active is the county court. Uh, this painting is, of course, done showing Patrick Henry speaking uh, before the Hanover County Court, uh, a little bit to our south between here and Richmond, arguing uh, against the uh, paying of uh, excessive salaries to the uh, reverends of the Church of England. But it gives you kind of an idea of what a court day looks like. And in our case, we're talking about these gentlemen sitting up here at the top of the row. Those are the justices of the peace or the magistrate justices of the county. Much like the militia captains, they're sort of apportioned out throughout the county geographically, population-wise. And they hold, at the time, pretty much all powers of justice within the county, low and high justice. So everything from misdemeanors, land disputes, fence disputes, all the way up to murders, arsons, assaults, and things like that. So they had the power to not only condemn to death, but also to check your fence line to make sure you've not overrun your neighbor's property boundary. A lot of authority, a lot of responsibility, and they are appointed by the king. That's kind of a name only. The king delegates that authority to the royal governor. The royal governor is the one that actually signs off on the paper, but he does make sure they are going to be men who at least align broadly with the royal regime, uh, such as it may be. So he is appointed to the county magistrate court in January of 1764. 
Uh, Richard, as I mentioned, had been a county magistrate. You see a lot of the same family names popping up. The Lees, the Yules, the Blackburns, through the generations following each other, if not directly on the court, within a couple of years when their fathers pass. So that puts him on the county court. Now, it's also worth mentioning not only do they hold judicial power, they also hold the legislative power for the county. So rather than having a separate board of supervisors or anything else like that, the county court are the ones that handle any sort of county rules and regulations. There aren't many. They mostly have to do with enforcing state or colonial regulations related to things like free roaming livestock, fence boundaries, taxes, and things like that. Um, all right, Billy. So some of the next things that are going to be major events in his life, uh, the rest of the 1760s are, for Prince William County, fairly quiet. Um, the county was not really significantly hurt by the French and Indian War. We aren't far enough west. And locally, it's a fairly prosperous time. The tobacco industry is doing well. Um, Prince William County farmers are not yet experiencing the severe problems with soil loss and field fertility they will in a few years. So it's kind of the coming to the end of the golden age that Thomas is experiencing in the 1760s. Ripon, the plantation is doing well. His family is expanding. Uh, he's still handling a lot of the estate of his father, uh, Richard. They're still handling, parceling some of that out uh, and paying off his debts. Uh, as well as selling off a lot of that land. As I mentioned before, uh, they may have spent time in the Winchester area in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, that's partially because Richard had accumulated land, as I mentioned, all the way from here to what's now West Virginia. Not as one continuous plantation, but in about 1,000 or so or less acre tracks at a time. He would either take them in payment sometimes for projects he worked on uh, or would patent them himself with the royal government or buy them from estate owners. If you thought there was a likely piece of land, you could then acquire that, plant tobacco, move in enslaved workmen and an overseer and add to his empire. Thomas, on the other hand, realizes he doesn't really need all that. Uh, it's a lot of effort to put into that, um, to managing all those estates and the cash and farming and the enslaved population. So he starts pruning off a lot of that to pay his own debts as the years go on including land in the Winchester area and the like. But in 1774, that's going to see a major shift in Virginia. Uh, up at a little place called Boston, in Massachusetts, uh, the early rumblings of the, the final break, <laughs> it's quite a sentence to construct, uh, but in reality, Boston had not really been sitting very happily throughout the last decade, but most of the other colonies were sort of riding along and not paying much attention to that until the Boston Tea Party and protestations against ongoing taxes to pay for the French and Indian War, which eventually lead to the Boston Port Acts. And that sends a shockwave throughout the colonies. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Massachusetts legislature has been locked out of their offices and out of the state house. They're not supposed to meet, pass laws. All the other colonies around them are going, wait, hold on, <laughs> that could be us. Uh, the next time we do something the king doesn't like, they'll shut us out. Uh, it also comes to heavier restrictions on trade and closing of the port of Boston. So as that sort of reverberates out through the colonies, Prince William County will, uh, in June of 1774, be one of the first counties in Virginia to pass a set of resolves. They're known as the Prince William Resolves, dealing with establishing um, a boycott of British goods and sort of trying to freeze out and punish the British to prevent them from doing what they did in Massachusetts in Virginia, uh, if Virginia keeps going like that. Thomas is involved with that. He was likely one of the men who was at that meeting in Dumfries in June of 1774. And part of it is because we know by the end of the year, he is a member of the Prince William County Independent Cadets under William Grayson. William Grayson's one of the county's most leading citizens in the revolutionary cause. Uh, and Thomas Blackburn is going to be appointed to be part of a committee that goes to George Washington, uh, at the time the county's most experienced military officer, or state's most experienced military officer, and ask him for advice on how the company should arm themselves, what sort of uniforms they should wear, what sort of tactics they should study. This is the fourth or fifth time that's happened to Washington. As this movement has spread throughout Virginia, Stafford County, Fairfax County, they've all sort of come to him for advice, and he 
gives Prince William County very similar advice on what equipment they need to do. And he, in fact, he helps purchase muskets for them in Philadelphia, one of which actually still survives in Philadelphia at the Museum of the American Revolution. So um, if you see one of their muskets on display there, it has a little, of course, ID label too, but it does show the Prince William engraved on top from when it was the property of the independent cadets. Now, along with that appointment, uh, he is also appointed to the committee to enforce the blockade, enforce the boycott against British goods in Prince William County, and eventually to the Committee of Public Safety in Prince William County. Now, again, much like the magistrate's board, it's not really so much of an elected position as it is um, those leading citizens of the revolutionary cause sort of banding together and sort of establishing that committee to begin with, and then sort of voting within each other to replace it from year to year. But this is the big break from that traditional mindset of following that chain up to eventually potentially an appointment as Lieutenant Governor or an officer in the Crown Forces or a colonial post in another colony. That's gone in 1774. Thomas has broken with that chain and is now following the new path. He set himself uh, up with the revolutionaries and eventually with a break with the Crown. But in the midst of all that, he does receive a very traditional appointment himself. Very early in the year, in April of 1774, he sits on his first Dettingen Parish vestry meeting. He's been appointed to replace Cuthbert Bullitt, um, another local citizen. The older one, the younger one, uh, is also being appointed at the same time. But this is going to be a uh, pretty obvious appointment. His, his father-in-law is the minister, <laughs> so he's a friendly face on the vestry. But it is an important position because at the time they do handle all of the poor relief, all of the disaster relief in the county, it tends to funnel through the Church of England's coffers. Um, they handle the county poor farm. And of course, the religious life of the county is very important to most of its citizens. So sitting on the vestry is, is a very um, proper recognition of, of service and uh, trustworthiness to the county. Well, if you can advance that up. 1774 is also going to bring him uh, kind of to his apex of his authority and power in Prince William County, or at least the beginning of it. Uh, he is elected to replace Fushi Tebbs, another local resident of Dumfries, um, who is not able to make the next session of the House of Burgesses. He is elected to replace him. Uh, however, when he arrives for his first session in May of 1774, Lord Dunmore does what they've been afraid Lord Dunmore, the royal governor, is going to do. He dissolves the Virginia legislature and denies them the ability to meet. Um, they say, okay, that's great. They go across the street to the Raleigh Tavern in Williamsburg and meet in the Apollo Room as a convention assembled of the people's representatives and ignore and shut out the royal government uh, for the final time. Lord Dunmore's not going anywhere yet. He's going to be a... Uh, at the very least a boogeyman in the closet, if not an active antagonist for the next several years uh, as he assembles an army in Norfolk and then in Gwynn's Island and raids throughout uh, Eastern Virginia. And of course there the Prince William County resolves in the coercive acts, the Boston Port Acts. So this is kind of the, the last of the big traditional Virginia offices he's going to hold. That House of Burgesses position brings you then within range of the governor's council, within range of royal privilege and royal authority that's not being handed out just from the largess of the governor because he knew your father, but on your own achievements and own accomplishments. And again, potentially brings you within the direct view of the crown. A lot of possibility, a lot of opportunity, but as I say, that house is gone by the end of 1774, functionally, if not officially, and is replaced with the Virginia Convention. Um, you have the next slide, Billy. So the Virginia Conventions, they have to be reconvened every session. Um, throughout the war, it's going to keep going up in number, the first Virginia Convention, the second Virginia Convention, until by the end of the war, they just give up, and they just convene it as um, the Virginia Convention, the final time, and then it becomes the House of Delegates and the Senate at the end of the war. Um, there are six. Thomas is a member of the first four, which are only meeting for a couple months at a time, um, until he is replaced by Dr. Bullitt, his fellow vestryman, neighbor in Prince William County, uh, in April of 1776. Uh, so also with that move, uh, several of the conventions don't meet in Williamsburg at all. They're meeting in Richmond at St. James Church there, off to the side. 
Uh, he's also, as I mentioned, on those local and state commissions. Perhaps the most significant that takes him away from home the longest and gives him uh, a great amount of authority and responsibility is uh, Lord Dunmore and the militia, kind of brought both of those up in passing before. Uh, Lord Dunmore, as part of his ongoing attempts to reassert royal authority, he had blocked funding for the militia for several years um, for training, for uniforms, muskets, the colony's powder supply, things like that. They came back to bite him when the settlers in Western Virginia uh, were attacked by the Shawnee. Of course, part of the treaty ending the French and Indian War had declared English settlers would not cross west of the Allegheny Proclamation line. They were already west of that line, so how much good it did, not much. But by 1775, the Shawnee, or 1774, the Shawnee were tired of dealing with that. Uh, they lived along through Western Virginia and Ohio. They had kept up their end of the bargain and the English hadn't. So they launched an assault across the river, sending raiding parties, hopefully either to convince the crown to come back to the bargaining table or to physically move those settlers out of the area by making it uh, too dangerous for them to live there. Uh, Lord Dunmore and the Lewis brothers, Andrew and John, raise an emergency army of volunteers and militia from Eastern and Western Virginia. They fight a significant battle at Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where Chief Cornstalk, the leader of the Shawnee, uh, meets Dunmore and the Lewises in battle. Um, Cornstalk's son is killed. Several other prominent uh, leaders of the Shawnee are killed or wounded or captured. And that sort of breaks the assault. That brings them to the bargaining table, but it puts the Shawnee in a much worse position. In the end, Dunmore negotiates a new treaty. The Shawnee agreed to not cross the Ohio River whatsoever. And that will hold at least for two years, <laughs> so much as it does. But what that means is with no appropriations ready to pay these men, the governor has to then promise, oh, well, we'll, 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 have, a, we'll have a committee come out to visit you and, and judge compensation. Well, then the revolution begins, and the convention, wanting to get those men into Virginia state uniforms, hypothetically, uh, they'll be wearing hunting shirts one way or the other, uh, but get those men onto the continental side, uh, assembles a committee in short order and sends them west. One of those men is Thomas Blackburn, another will be Henry Lee from across the river at Lee, Sylvania. Uh, they travel all the way out to Pittsburgh, quote the journey in those days when you have to go up and around and down the rivers. But they meet there, they meet in Romney, West Virginia, and then they meet in uh, Winchester, Virginia, in each successive location holding these compensation commission meetings. They have the power to pay out wide sums of money. They just have to judge how much money you were owed based on what the agreement was originally, based on the equipment you brought, whether you paid for your own horses or you brought wagons, paid for your own forage and fodder. So this is, it's a big deal, being able to handle that much money and that much authority. Uh, by all means, it seems they did fairly well. Nobody really complained about it too much. And a lot of those soldiers would then shortly be in uh, Virginia and Continental Service within a year or so. Uh, it seems, as I said, that lasts from August to October. It takes him away from the seat of power in Williamsburg, but it does give him a lot of extraordinary power to help or hinder residents of the western part of the state, uh, which is the, the most up and coming growing part of Virginia at the time. Um, as I mentioned, this is arguably the apex of his power. He's been trusted with a great amount of authority and that's going to last through those last series of conventions. Um, really? Click forward. Um, that culminates, even though he loses his seat in the House of Burgesses in December of 1776, right before Christmas, he is commissioned as a lieutenant colonel in Virginia's state army. Um, getting into some confusing Revolutionary War military things. But Virginia already raised quite a few regiments that ended up being in continental service. They'd had to go up north and join Washington's army, or they'd gone south to the Carolinas to join continental armies. Leaving Virginia, not entirely defenseless, but definitely without the number of troops they would prefer. So they raised two new regiments, two state line regiments for defense of Virginia, and at the same time, pretty much, uh, within a couple months of each other. And Thomas is commissioned as the second in command of the second regiment. Uh, this is, again, quite the amount of authority and responsibility, his time in the cadets and his militia service before that, uh, rising to the colonelship of Prince William County's militia regiment, likely played a significant role in getting him that commission. Um, that was handed down by Governor Henry, Patrick Henry, 
who again, through his time in the House of Burgesses, brief as it had been, uh, had brought him in personal contact with uh, Patrick Henry as he was a Burgess himself. Now, uh, if you've seen the date there below it, that did not last very long, only about six months. Um, he received his commission. He attended briefly uh, the training camps in Williamsburg, but as not really very many men had been recruited yet, he didn't see much reason to spending all of his time there himself with a family and plantation, county court and county par church parish business to attend to back home. Uh, unfortunately, that meant uh, one of his Junior officers, Major Gibbons, was more in the public eye during that six months. And so when their commander, the colonel, resigned, the major was promoted over him to colonelship of the regiment. Uh, Thomas took that as a massive slight. He wrote a very, uh, it's very empath, empath, em, yeah, emphatic letter, shall we say, to Governor Henry about how he had no more military experience than he did. He seemed like a great guy, but this totally did away with any concept of seniority and responsibility and was a mass massive slight to his personality um, and personage and shall we say ego. So he resigns his commission June 10th, 1777. It is worth saying he didn't have to. He would have kept that Lieutenant Colonel's rank until he was appointed to a different unit or appointed to a staff position, uh, but instead he resigned. Uh, and for something we'll talk about in a moment, might have significantly influenced um, his reasoning behind that. But uh, I do want to point out in the picture here, um, these troops are from the Virginia State Garrison Regiment, uh, which was formed in 1777. But most of Virginia State troops wore a very similar uniform, um, what we think of kind of as the typical Continental Army uniform, even if it really wasn't, but blue coat, red facings, red linings, uh, and for enlisted men, a red vest, um, and then you can see the sergeant here is wearing a, an overcoat as well. Most of that clothing for the enlisted men came out of the state arsenal, state stores in Williamsburg. Officers could purchase cloth from that or they could purchase their own cloth to make a nicer, more comfortable uniform for themselves, which it's likely Thomas did. Or he very well might have been wearing his independent cadet uniform, which um, he likely would have only had made a year before, still in perfectly good shape. Um, but may have changed out the colors of it a little bit, at least. And the reasoning being, as I mentioned, um, why he may not have been so eager to continue in state service is the Philadelphia campaign. British Army is moving out of New York. Um, intelligence indicates they are likely to land somewhere either in Virginia, in the Chesapeake Bay area, or in the upper reaches of the bay with an object of capturing the national capital at Philadelphia. These rumors are fairly widespread. And on top of that, there were quite a few other um, local gentlemen that had gone to the Continental Army as volunteers. They'd not been commissioned in the state regiments. They'd not been commissioned in some of the uh, continental regiments that had been raised through multiple states yet. But there was a whole class of officers, the gentlemen volunteers, that existed in the 17 and 1800s that really have vanished uh, since armies became more and more professionalized. And that is basically the concept that if you are a gentleman, as Thomas definitely is, he's a former militia colonel, he owns substantial land and holdings in Prince William County, member of the church vestry, former House of Burgesses, former state lieutenant colonel, he's not going to go just serve as an enlisted man. He's not gonna go pick up a musket and fight in the ranks. He's got more experience than that. He has more training and more knowledge. But the army only has so many officer commissions. So if you volunteer, generally with a, a general <laughs> uh, or other officer that needs somebody who's trustworthy, can do correspondence and writing, can be a sympathetic ear or a helpful advocate for you, uh, you can fill out your staff with gentlemen volunteers and you don't have to pay them. That's the best part. They're volunteers. So you get the skills and experience, but then you don't have to actually pay them. That's where the volunteer part comes in. They have to pay all of their own food. They have to pay for their own clothing, their own lodging, and then serve their time uh, in the military with the hopes, as Washington puts it, no gentleman volunteer comes without the hope of a continental commission. Um, this is the way Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, and many other officers of the revolution start their careers is as gentleman volunteers on a general staff. Now, for a long time, the family lore was that Thomas had served on Washington staff. 
Uh, Washington had a, an immense train of officers and volunteers and soldiers that made up his staff and handled the management of the army. But here's the thing. Uh, if you spend any amount of time with George Washington, the George Washington, our president, first president, leader of the revolutionary cause in the global mind after the war, somebody wrote it down. In fact, in modern times, there are several books written solely about Washington's aides and staff, and Thomas is not in any of them. However, there are some clues we can take from other sources. This was largely a void for a very long time. We knew Thomas was at Germantown. There are two letters, one from Dr. James Wallace, who was an army surgeon, and a, another reference from his obituary in 1807, Dr. Wallace writes in the opening of a letter to his brother uh, that he had seen Carl Blackburn and carried him from the Moravian Hospital where he'd been wounded in the thigh to a hospital in Baltimore to be taken care of by his uncle, Gustavus Brown. So he was clearly at Germantown. If he was wounded, an army surgeon was taking care of him and carrying him to another army hospital. He was somewhere on that field. The second mention is his obituary. This was still a time, 1807, when many of the revolutionary generation are still living. And it would be very easy if he published his obituary with a blatant lie, such as, I was at the Battle of Germantown. Nobody was going to publish that if it wasn't at least somewhat accurate. He had been on the battlefield at least. But by the time his pension was applied for, about 30 years later, it had become that he was an aide to Washington, which was very quick to be disproven by the War Department, and they rejected his pension application. But now, a few years ago, there's a massive volunteer effort to digitize and scan and, and transcribe a lot of Revolutionary War pensions. And one of those pensions was by, from a man from Bedford, Virginia, named William McLaughlin. He was a private in the 5th Virginia Regiment. And he recorded that as his regiment made their advance oh, here on the flank of the Battle of Germantown with General Wayne and his forces engaging the light infantry and grenadiers on the flank, that his commander, Colonel Parker, was wounded on the battlefield and that he was ordered to take a wagon and bring Colonel Parker and Colonel Blackburn and several other officers off the field. Now, there were several other Blackburns that served in the Revolutionary War, but none of them would have been in that vicinity or were at that battle other than Thomas Blackburn. So this is where we get into a little more conjecture. The fifth is under the command of General, the Reverend, Peter Muhlenberg longtime Winchester minister, Lutheran leading light of Virginia, and very well-known, popular uh, local resident. That Blackburn connection between Winchester and Reverend Muhlenberg and Thomas likely played an important role in getting him a position as a gentleman volunteer, likely on the staff of General Muhlenberg. There are some records that survive from General Muhlenberg's papers, but they're not complete. And it's entirely possible as a volunteer, he did not show up in the official army paperwork. So while this is an avenue we're still pursuing, we believe today that Thomas was indeed at the Battle of Germantown. He was indeed wounded in the thigh and carried off to a Continental Army hospital. But it's likely he was carrying orders and messages for General Muhlenberg on the battlefield. But to make it there, when he resigns his commission in June, he likely departed Prince William County within a few weeks either in early mid-July or by August at the latest. So that's likely the reason he ended up resigning his state commission rather than weighing it out and seeing what came down the pike, is he saw there was an opportunity coming to raise his star and raise uh, his own personal glory, as well as serve the continental cause better than sitting at home would have done. However, uh, Billy, if you'll click us down a little bit further. It didn't end up working out quite as well as he'd hoped. His wound plagues him the rest of his life. Uh, as I mentioned, he is wounded in the upper thigh. It's not exactly clear from the existing letters and sources we have whether that was a musket ball, uh, which would have been a 75 caliber likely weapon. Uh, that's the British standard musket caliber. That's about a little more than an ounce of lead that hits your body and deforms a bit like a mushroom cap as it goes through. Uh, he's extraordinarily lucky he didn't lose the leg, and he's extraordinarily lucky he didn't bleed to death from trauma or damage to the arteries in the thigh groin area. But he does survive. However, he's never really able to walk well again. That's mentioned in later family letters. It plagues him the rest of his life. 
For the first few years, he has trouble riding a horse or even riding in a carriage uh, from the pain the jolting causes in his leg. Uh, it's likely also um, illness, fever resulting from that, that um, by the early 1780s, he mentions in several letters hearing loss. He's starting to go deaf, which could possibly have been a result of fever or other uh, side effects from his extensive recovery and wounding. What that means is because of his deafness and his difficulty traveling, uh, Thomas Jefferson had offered him a position on the Virginia Governor's Council or the Privy Council. When the convention is not meeting, those men run Virginia. They have almost absolute authority to raise troops, disperse money, pass laws, confiscate land, and they are, of course, the closest men to the sitting governor. However, uh, while he's appointed in uh, 1779, he does not ever make any of the meetings uh, and declines the official appointment uh, that spring in March of 1780. And that's where you see his career begin to come off the rails. He's gone, served in the army, he's been wounded, but that wound is going to prevent him from some of the most critical years of the revolution taking active part in the revolution. We know throughout that time frame he continues to support um, the men in the field, uh, sells horses, livestock, hay, hogs, everything essentially for monopoly money. Um, he takes county or state uh, bounty money, which is either continental paper, which is worthless, or it's the promise that Virginia will someday pay you in the future. Spoiler, they never will. <laughs> so he's essentially giving away quite a bit of his crops through those late 1770s, 1780s timeframe. And tobacco is, of course, with the Royal Navy, the largest Navy in the world, sitting off of the coast. Tobacco is not going very uh, far at all. If it does, it's typically going to the Caribbean to buy gunpowder and muskets for the Continental Congress. So financially, Thomas is taking a hit. Prestige-wise, he's taking a hit. Physically, mentally, he is suffering from the results of his injuries. And his family is, of course, troubled by all this at the same time. They're dealing with their father's uh, illness and potential death. Um, it's quite possible as any number of other soldiers who came back from the front wounded only to die a year or two later, uh, that they might have to deal with that as well. But they don't in the end, and then start to look back up. Uh, in 1783, 84, he is appointed to a commission with General Horatio Gates and George Washington to represent Virginia in the Maryland legislature at Annapolis on the issue of the Potomac Company. It's an effort to install a canal and bypass lock system around Great Falls and some of the other upper reaches of the Potomac to increase travel and trade out along the Potomac River to its upper reaches in what's now West Virginia. Thomas has a big role in that, partially because along with George Washington and General Gates, he owns a lot of land out along those upper reaches, has a very distinct interest in making sure that himself and the people he sells land to uh, have a way to get their crops easily to market. Now, in the end, uh, they don't, post it, postal system bites him uh, again in that uh, he's not informed of this meeting until he is in Winchester and then Martinsburg, <laughs> Virginia. Uh, he is far out west and is not able to get back in time to make those meetings uh, because, again, the notice of his commission did not arrive till he had left home. Uh, unfortunately, that means he will meet, miss those meetings and only be involved kind of on the back end. And that's really the last attempt he has to regain that prestige that he had before the war. Uh, and unfortunately, that's going to see his arc start to plummet back down. After that 1784 committee, he's never going to hold another county position. And in 1789, he writes, um, not even directly to Washington, he writes uh, Theodore Bland, um, Revolutionary War officer, friend of his, asks him to put in a word for him with Washington um, on getting a position with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, Washington doesn't even bother addressing that. When he replies, leaves out anything about Blackburn, and Blackburn will never hold a federal post himself. Now, again, kind of hearkening back to that early time frame we talked about with uh, of course, the beginning of his life, where would be if we didn't cover uh, his own children? Because uh, for Thomas, that's definitely one way his legacy extended 
and expanded through time to our present day, and part of the reason we still have Rip and Lodge in existence uh, as we do now. Uh, his daughter Anne will marry Bushrod Washington, George's beloved nephew, in 1785. Uh, the wedding is held at Ripon. George and Martha don't attend. There is another wedding being held that day at their place at Mount Vernon. Um, Bushrod and Anne lived in Alexandria while he pursued his law career. He was appointed a Supreme Court Justice, and then after George and Martha pass, they move into Mount Vernon and take over the farm there. Uh, however, they do not have any children of their own, and when Anne passes, the estate will pass to her niece, Jane Charlotte Blackburn, and her husband, John Augustus, Augustine Washington. As I mentioned, Thomas's health never really recovers, and unfortunately, neither does his and Christian's youngest daughter, Polly. Uh, Polly suffers from, it was likely tuberculosis, while Thomas is, of course, suffering from his leg wounds uh, and um, some other health issues. For their health, they head to Barbados in 1791 to the Caribbean. Uh, they stay there about two years. Uh, hoping that Polly's health will recover and that the climate will improve uh, Thomas's um, health issues. It does not. Polly passes away in Barbados, and Christian and Thomas begin making their way back to Virginia in 1793 through the Carolinas, visiting friends and family as they come all the way back up uh, to Virginia to Ripon Lodge. Now, I will mention as well, even though Thomas's prestige has faded, he is still able to write a letter to Alexander Hamilton at the time, leading the United States Army being formed to fight France during what we'd eventually call the Quasi War in the late 1790s. Um, before that, as Secretary of the Treasury, Thomas writes him with a suggestion for one of the new United States Army's officers, and that is his son, Richard Scott Blackburn. And the letter that he wrote does not survive, so what he said to Hamilton we don't know, but it was convincing. Hamilton endorsed the recommendation, and Richard is commissioned a captain in the Regiment of Artillerists and Engineers in 1794. He's then promoted to major in 1803, and for all those folks out there who um, either served in the military or, or know a little bit about ranks, major is not a super high position in the Army today. It's either a, a battalion, second in command, potentially commands a smaller unit, separate unit. In 1803, that puts him about fourth in command of the army, if you keep going down the list. <laughs> there are not very many colonels, lieutenant colonels, and majors in the army at the time. Unfortunately, uh, he will die on active duty, November 1803 in Georgia, leading a portion of his regiment uh, along the Spanish border with Florida, and will be buried there. And unfortunately, since then, the way the river has shifted, has covered over that fort and that graveyard where he was buried. Now, Richard did have a brother, Thomas Blackburn Jr., more familiarly known to the family as Tommy, even when he was a 30-year-old army officer. <laughs> His mom still calls him Tommy, but who doesn't have that happen? Um, he served as a cadet in his brother's company, then was commissioned in the cavalry, and then was a lieutenant in the 4th Infantry before the army was cut back under Jefferson and he was discharged. Uh, he moved to Kentucky, married, uh, started a life there, and when his father passes away, he is not really very involved in disposing of the estate other than send me any money that's left over once dad's debts are paid. He passes away in 1821 in Kentucky, but starts a whole line of Blackburns, uh, as his brother did in Virginia and Pennsylvania, that we still have visitors come today from uh, Western Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, um, Alexandria area that are descendants of these two and of Jane Charlotte and uh, her husband. So here we come to the end, July 17th, 1807, almost 30 years after his wounding at Germantown, 20 years after his last major political office, and he receives probably one of the largest obituaries that year in the Alexandria Gazette um, at his death. Of course, mentions there, severe and dangerous wound at Germantown and distinguished for his generosity, his bravery, and true sense of honor. He was no less constant for his hospitality, benevolence, and charity. When Thomas passed, he leaves behind massive debts. Between his taking on a lot of continental money and continental promises and state promises during the revolution, the crash of the tobacco market after the war, they have to sell everything. 
between Christian and Anne and uh, younger Thomas, they auction everything from his clothes, the food and wine in the cellar, the furniture, the glassware, and eventually Rip and Lodge, the house and plantation itself in 1811. Uh, Christian will spend the rest of her life with her daughters, um, Sarah and Anne, and uh, in the area. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, will pass away in 1815, uh, eight years after her husband. So with all that in mind, let me click to the next one. We do have to look back kind of not only at Thomas's life, but also that course of honor, that cursus honorum, as he followed it from the 1760s all the way up to the 1780s. Between two different worlds, two different systems that have those connections between the old royal ways of Britain and the new Republican traditions of the United States, he bridged that gap, but then fell between the planks at the very end. So while Thomas may not have achieved the fame William Grayson did, or George Washington, or Thomas Jefferson, he still was a major part of Prince William County life and traditions throughout his lifetime and played a major role in his own community, which is something I think is, should be an inspiration to us all, is that even if we're not going to be president someday, we can always still do our best to help our community and help our families uh, the best we can. So, quick one more. So I do have a, a brief bibliography image credits if anybody wants those later. Um, but thank you all for coming. Thanks for listening to my talk. And I know everybody's ready for lunch, but if we do have any questions, I'll take a couple, or I will be here afterwards. So thank you all again for coming to my presentation. It's named after his family. Um, they actually, I didn't mention it, but they did own Yorkshire through his lifetime. Uh, Yorkshire Plantation as well. So that area we believe, Blackburn Man and Blackburn Road and Eastern Prince William were both named for them. Is yes, that, oh. Is that research still going on with the digitizing records and finding more? Yes, so this is, um, a lot of those records were scanned over the last about decade or so. But this is, um, it's called Revolutionary War in the South. They started just looking at ap pension applications from men who served in the Southern campaign of the revolution. So from Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, uh, Maryland. But they're expanding that out steadily and they're, they're transcribing more and more of these records every year. It's an ongoing project. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As I understand it, George Washington broke his relationship with George Mason over political differences. Did his relationship with Thomas Blackburn just fade because he was too busy? It's interesting to see how their personal and professional relationships are very different. Uh, up until Thomas's, or oh, until George's death, they're very much personally in contact. Um, Thomas is a frequent visitor to Mount Vernon, but we don't see that parlay itself into political roles. Um, my thinking, honestly, has always been that he needed more political cash out of these positions than by giving it to his brother-in-law uh, would get him, and also was helping Thomas on the side anyway, so he didn't really need the money, per se. Um, politically, interestingly enough, the Blackburns remained very ardent Federalists throughout Thomas's life and his sons. Um, Richard, I didn't mention it, but it, kind of an interesting story. When he commanded the forts and garrison in Norfolk, um, he actually got in a physical fight with a Jeffersonian editor in the newspaper there and had to be pulled off the guy. He was hitting him with his cane. Um, so they remained very dyed in the wool Federalists even after Washington's death. Um, so politically, they remained sort of broadly aligned with that. And that definitely did not help his political chances, uh, being a well-known Federalist in very Democratic Republican Virginia. Uh, but I didn't mention that Richard did, a, younger Richard did also serve in the House of Burgesses. So had two generations at least that uh, served in the legislature. Anybody else? Well, no, once again, thank you all for coming and uh, have a good lunch and we'll see you back afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>